sitting in VIP with a guy I barely know. He kept trying like Aaliyah, so I told him I would go. His pockets were small, but his chain weighed a ton. I called them Biggie Smalls, but no big pun. And then I saw these girls, they were pointing from the bar. I must have seen me pull up in my red Ferrari. I'm like, girl, don't push me because you missed the mark. Only thing that I push is my push to start. And then I took a shot, a shot of vodka. And then I took a puff, I'm not a Rasta. What I look like, girl, I'm not her. She rolled her eyes, then I walked up like, do, 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 do. La, 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 yes, I'm talking to you. If you keep on talking shit, I'ma pull out my... E2 of healthcare, doctors misdiagnosing, dismissing, even gaslighting their female patients. I heard everything from you're just tired to um, one doctor actually said, well, I think it's just because you have your period. I was told that I was, I was overweight, I needed to lose weight, that I was uh, depressed and needed therapy. For four years, Maria Garcia suffered from intense stomach and back pain but says her doctors told her there was nothing wrong. She just needed to slim down. When her symptoms escalated, vomiting, weakness, and hair loss, she says her specialist still dismissed her. I begged him for a CAT scan. Please do something. This is not right. Oh, you just have to learn to live with it. You feel completely crazy. I started to believe them. I thought, maybe I am crazy. Health failing, she finally went to the ER at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, where a scan revealed the terrifying truth. Maria had a 25-pound cancerous tumor growing in her ovary. Surgeons were able to remove it. Just Hi, good evening, and welcome to <clears throat> Long Bench Chat. My name is Claudette Esterine Campbell, and I am the chairperson of the Daughters of Chief Sheba Foundation. With me this evening, I have a very special guest, and she will be talking with us about the issue that we, we watch briefly. Uh, it's not about um, whatever it is that that lady has, but it's about being misdiagnosed and the, the implications of being misdiagnosed. And misdiagnosis is a big thing in the news recently with the, um, I think it was a few days ago, uh, a, a popular TikToker uh, who was misdiagnosed for about a couple of years. She died a couple of days ago um, after um, they found out that she actually had cancer after, like the woman in the video, being sent home uh, so many times um, saying that, oh, you just it's just your period, so you have strong period pains and so forth. So this is an issue that plagues women. And um, it's not just, yes, it happens a lot in the United States. It happens a lot among the black women, but it happens everywhere and among all kinds of women. So this evening, I'd like to bring in my guest, Anya Nicholson, and she will share her story on this long bench with us this evening about how she was misdiagnosed and the implications of that misdiagnosis and what she is now doing about it. So I thank you for joining us. As I said, I'm Claudette Esterine Campbell, and I am the president and chairperson of the Daughters of Sheba Foundation. A quick um, telling of who the Daughters of Sheba Foundation is. We are a Canadian organization. We are a small nonprofit organization here in Canada that um, we work mainly with women and their children um, to, to bring about insightful, educational, informative material on social media. And we also do direct intervention with a select few women. So this evening, let me bring in my guest, Anya. And hi, how are you, Anya? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Like I said to Anya um, behind the scenes, we are not, I don't, I used to, when I first started doing interviews, I would send questions, but I don't anymore. Um, I wanted to remain spontaneous. 
And so to, to, to keep that spontaneity, um, I want to start off with my usual questions about yourself so that my guests and viewers will, will understand who my guest is and um, where you're from. And, you know, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Anya. You don't have to tell us your street address, but what's, I know you're in the United States, but what state are you living in? Have you lived there for all of your life? And, um, and then I have another question after that. Well, I'm in South Florida in Palm Beach County or Wellington. I've lived here since, well, I've lived in South Florida since 1990. I'm originally from New Jersey. And I actually spent um, almost half of the last two years up in Canada while my husband was working oh. on, um, on Site C. Okay. Uh, it's in British Columbia. It's an electric okay, hydro yeah. dam. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. Uh, you are the second person in a month who who I've spoken with and um, like this, and you are either vis visited Canada or lived in Canada for a while or living in Canada. So did you like it in BC? I love it in BC. I did like it. The only problem was my kids were bored out of their minds because we were in a you know, small town and everything was six hours away. We were like six hours north of Edmonton. Mm. Uh, I did have a, I do have a friend in Edmonton, so we went and to the water park and the entertainment park in the mall, which was fun. But they were oh. really bored and they missed their homeschool community that they grew up in. So right, we right. came back. Okay, okay. So um, speaking of your kids, one of my favorite. I, I didn't have a, a necessarily happy childhood, but in the periods that were happy, I can count Sundays, and Sundays was one of my happy periods. And um, why? Because Sunday dinner was the best dinner ever um, of the week. So as a parent, what are what is your favorite meal to prepare on a Sunday? And is it your favorite or the kids' favorite? What's what? Well, we eat very different. We were raw vegan. My kids were raw vegan for many years. They eat cooked food for dinner now, but they have to have their raw food. Like they eat fruit all day long until dinner. And then one of them has a salad, the other one has raw cauliflower rice, and then they have something like um, vegan quesadillas or vegan burgers. Um, I'm not, I don't tell other people they shouldn't eat meat, but because of my health, I found that eliminating meat gave my body more energy to help heal. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to cook meat anymore. So <laughs> I learned, I used to um, always love to cook. I mean, I've always loved it. So I learned how to make things like cake, candy, bread all all raw like in the dehydrator or else just other ways um mm -hmm. i got really creative found other recipes and made sure that they enjoyed it so. okay okay not vegan myself but from time to time i have i have the feeling of i cannot take another piece of meat in my mouth you know i i have my own health issues too so i i i, I know what you mean when you say that you can't for health reasons so let's jump right in then um so the story, when I reached out to you, um, I got it mixed up a little bit because I thought it was your child who, who, who um, had brain injury during your giving birth to the child, but you, you cleared that up for me. But before we go right into that, just tell us a little bit. And you also sent me a photograph of, of yourself at one weight and then... Um, the second like before and after so, so just walk us through what happened with you when it started and you know just walk us through if you don't mind I will interject from time to time so I always struggled with my weight from I think eight years old I went on my first diet the thin kids diet I gained more weight <laughs> every diet I was put on I gained weight and they would tell me I was cheating I couldn't figure it out so the video you showed in the beginning I've been through every everything those women said, plus a lot more, mm -hmm. where, where doctors would tell me, oh, just lose weight, honey, and your problems will go away. So I did lose the weight. And you know what? My problems did not go away. So what happened with me is I had polycystic ovarian syndrome, which um, ha has, it has insulin resistance. And what happens is the light, so basically, every month, a woman starts uh, having five to seven follicles mature in one ovary. And then one gets bigger and ovulates, and then the other ones disappear. With polycystic ovarian syndrome, what happens is you get about 10 to 12 follicles in each ovary, but there's not one that takes over. So you don't ovulate 
And then the, the other follicles don't disappear and they line up around the edge of the ovary and they give out hormones that cause you health issues. Mm -hmm. And this is all related to insulin resistance and puts you at very high risk for getting diabetes type two, which my father had, which I was very scared of getting. And so, you know, I couldn't, I had a very hard time getting, well, I wasn't trying to get pregnant, but I was told I wouldn't be able to have children without fertility treatments. And I had a high stress job and I got on metformin, which helps regulate your insulin. And boom. I'm a diabetic. I got pregnant just like that without even trying one time. <laughs> and <laughs> so during my, my pregnancy, I started spotting, I think around 11 weeks. And then at my 20 week ultrasound, we found out that my placenta was completely or covering my cervix. It's called complete placenta previa. So I was very highly monitored because you can bleed to death. And let's see, um, so they monitored me. They told me it resolved at one point. So when I went into labor, my water broke, but I wasn't having a lot of contractions. And after I think like eight hours, I went eight or 12 hours, I went to the hospital and they wanted me to stay. And my labor just was not progressing, but I started passing all these big blood clots. And I knew that wasn't normal because I had been at my goddaughter and two of my best friends first. And there's no blood until you're actually pushing out the baby. So I knew something wasn't right. And they wanted me to go home. And I said, I don't think I should do that. And luckily, I had a doula with me. And after... Uh, can you just stop a minute and explain what's a doula? A doula, is, um, a doula is a woman who goes to the hospital with you or is at a home birth with you, if you have that. And she's kind of like your personal advocate and your best friend. She watches out for you. She makes sure that the hospital staff understand your wishes and that they don't get pushy with you. Okay. And gives your family a break if they need to go leave because it was, you know, I was 24 hours after my, my water broke before everything kind of fell apart. So she was there to support me. And after 24 hours, they pressured me into taking Pitocin. So I took an epidural, but it didn't take. It wasn't working. And they did another one. They redid the epidural after I pressured them. And they told me it didn't work because I was heavy because I'd put on a lot of weight while I was pregnant. And I was up to like 240 pounds, I think. And they turned the Pitocin up and I was dilating. I think I got up to a seven. And, you know, I was still progressing slowly. So I sent my family, like my parents and my in-laws and my husband, they went to eat in the hospital, thank goodness. But all their phones were on silent. Oh. So I felt this big gush. And I told my doula, because the nurse told me when I feel a big gush, it means I'm dilating more. So my doula was really, really calm and she went and got the nurse and the nurse came in and started passing out. Mm. So what happened is my placenta abrupted or separated. So it ripped off the uterus wall and I hemorrhaged losing over 30% of my blood. So then next thing I know, it, everybody's screaming and running around and trying to get my family, but their phones were off. So they had to call them over the loudspeaker and they rushed me in for an emergency C-section. And they were able to save my son because he was without oxygen. But I didn't get to see him. They took him from me. I didn't see him until he was swaddled and cleaned. I had a real disconnect with him in the beginning. And my milk didn't come in. That was my first sign that something was not right. But I didn't know that at the time. Nobody tells you. And after I had him, like, just things started getting worse. Like, my health started deteriorating. And then I couldn't lose weight, which I'd always been able to lose, you know, well, after I had figured out how to lose weight, because I did lose weight, I wasn't able to get it off that time, no matter what I did. And I started working out with a friend at one point. Actually, that's later on. I couldn't get pregnant again. I kept having miscarriage after miscarriage. Okay, so let's just, just pause there for one second. And I just also want to acknowledge our friends from Nigeria who has joined us. Um, thank you for joining us. So this was your first child. Yes. That's right. Because you have two children and this was yes. your first child. Mm -hmm. So you gave birth with difficulties. Uh, they, di they did a C-section. You you said that there was a disconnect from the baby at the beginning because, you know, you didn't see him immediately. The, you know, the usual putting the baby on the mom's chest, the breast and so forth. Mm -hmm. So then you left the hospital. This is what you're saying. And started to 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 get back into life. Right. I had a, a lactation consultant come because oh. everybody was trying to get me to breastfeed and I just, I, I didn't have any milk. Actually, when he was six days old, I had to take him to the ER because he wouldn't stop screaming. And that's mm -hmm. how I realized that I wasn't, he was starving to death, basically. Okay. Because my milk 
hadn't come in. So I got something called a supplemental nursing system, which is like a container you put around your neck and you tape a little tube to your breast. It's supposed to help stimulate milk production or it's a lot of people who adopt use that want to have that, that connection. And so I used that until he was six months old when he started screaming at me. And I said, that's enough. <laughs> Cause he was crying. I was crying. It wasn't good for any of us. Mm -hmm. So at that point I put him on formula and I just, something just wasn't right, but I wanted another child. You know, I did birthing therapy cause I was very traumatized by the birth. I couldn't talk about it for years without like breaking down sobbing. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up doing fertility treatments and I conceived my second son who was almost a triplet. He was the only one who made it. Okay. And then wow. at, when I was pregnant with him, my pelvis separated at like, I want to say 12 weeks, which is extremely early. And so I was put on bed rest. And these are all signs of some stuff I didn't know was coming. And then I had, I had planned to have a, a VBAC, which is a vaginal birth after cesarean with him, mm -hmm. but I got preeclampsia and I had a C-section at 37 weeks with him. Okay. I did have a very different C-section. At this one, they didn't tie down my arms. They didn't take him away. They lifted him up naked while he was still attached to the cord. They put him on my chest. It was a very different experience. I had a, a really awesome, awesome OB that people fly from all over to use, uh, Dr. Uh, Deliza Skeet Henry. She's okay. really well known in uh, Fort Lauderdale at Broward General Hospital. Okay. A lot of women go use her. And she herself had four C-sections and always wanted to have a natural birth and couldn't. So she really advocates for women. And so I had him and I just, my hair, I don't know, after I had him, oh, my milk also didn't come in for him. I got donor milk. But after I had him, like my hair started falling out. I started getting sicker. And I thought it was because of all the fertility drugs that I did, you know, we really didn't know. So at one point I started working out with a friend of mine and she had me get one of those fitness watches. And then she looked at it after a workout. She was a personal trainer and she's like, either the watch is broken or you're broken. Mm -hmm. So she had me go to the endocrinologist and they diagnosed me with hypothyroidism, but it was called secondary because they didn't know what was causing it. So awesome. I went and I saw a doctor that was an MD, but had started doing functional medicine as well after an injury that he had sustained. Mm -hmm. And he was able to help me figure out that the hypothyroidism, he said it would either be coming from my adrenal glands or from my HPA axis, which is your hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Mm -hmm. And we figured out that it was coming from my HPA axis. And I went and I started researching and I found this condition called Sheehan syndrome, which is a form of hypopituitarism that you can only get from hemorrhaging during childbirth or postpartum. And what happens is when a woman is pregnant, she has two to three times more blood than normal. And so the pituitary gland gets two to three times bigger than normal, like an overstretched water balloon. And it's extremely sensitive. So if you don't get oxygen up to the brain through the blood, the pituitary gland goes into shock and dies. And the first sign is your milk doesn't come in. And mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many women I have met who hemorrhage during childbirth and like me were never told. My doctor lied about how much blood I lost, by the way, on the paperwork. And I didn't get the transfusions that my insurance paid for for some reason. I was just mistreated all around. And so I just, I, I went and I got an MRI on my brain and it showed that my pituitary gland was flattened, which is called empty cella. So when it dies, it's like, looks like a pancake. One second. Can you indicate where the pituitary gland is just for those who don't know? It's inside the brain. So, okay. So that's so, why the MRI to the... To yeah. The, okay. So that was when my, my first son was eight years old that I found out. It took five more years of going around from doctor to doctor who laughed at me. And I was begging them for help. And I would tell them about the condition. And they told me it only happens in third world countries. Not true. I've met a lot of women and I've helped a lot of women get diagnosed. It's my, my life mission to help other women avoid what I went through. The average time for diagnosis with Sheehan syndrome is uh, 12 plus years and a lot of women die while waiting to have a doctor acknowledge them and treat them and i, I had gotten really really bad it just kept getting worse and worse we couldn't figure out what's wrong what syndrome is it called she hands s-h s-h-e-e h-a-n apostrophe s okay okay there they found it okay go ahead i've never heard that i know <laughs> barely anybody has 
And it's, um, I forget, I forget what percentage of women have it, but it's like one in several million or something. It's very rare. And although I think it's mostly mis un underreported, you know, it's right. not super common, but it's there. So during that time when I was really sick, one of my friends has suggested that I go vegan and start eating a lot more fruit to help because her stepfather had reversed diabetes with it. And every year I would be like, no, I only eat under 65 grams of carbs a day, not doing it. I don't want to gain more weight. And at one point I was so sick that she's like, what do you have to lose? And I was like, you're right. So I tried it and I started feeling better. And somebody had added me to a raw vegan group. And I went on there every day for months. And I saw that everybody in the group was there because they had some kind of illness or they had healed some kind of illness by eating this way. Mm -hmm. So I had switched my family to that. And that was actually, I had gone, uh, started eating that way before I got my diagnosis. So I had switched my family and it was actually helping keep me alive eating that way. So when I finally, because of COVID, there's a, a doctor that treats Sheehan syndrome, but he doesn't take insurance in LA, Dr. Friedman. And he, at the time you had to go see him before COVID in person and get all your testing done. It would have been $50,000 for me to go see him. And we didn't have oh, that wow. kind of money. But because of COVID, the one great thing that came was that he started doing FaceTime appointments and working with your doctor. So I was able to see him for $500. And he finally got me on hormone replacement because I needed thyroid hormone. And I had developed secondary adrenal insufficiency because I had been denied thyroid medicine for so long. So basically I stopped making enough cortisol and every time like I would get stressed or upset or overworked or hot or cold, it's just weird things. I would start going into adrenal crisis and you can die from adrenal crisis. But if you're looking at it, it looks a lot like an anxiety attack mm -hmm. if, you don't, if you don't test the blood. So there was one day that my husband drove me around to four ERs with our kids in the car and they would all laugh at me and make fun of me. And at the fourth ER, I got a woman on the phone that I'd found in a, a hypopituitary group. And she stayed on the phone with me until the doctor gave me cortisol. So I finally got on cortisol replacement. And for the next year, like, or six months, I started getting better. And it was like, I thought I was cured. Like I was getting my life back, but then I got worse. <laughs> and I started passing out and I hit my head really hard in the garage floor. And then I started having seizures. And I started having these muscle spasms where I couldn't straighten my right leg or my right arm. And I was in bed for like four months at a time. My husband had to help me bathe, go to the bathroom. I couldn't cook for my family and I, I homeschool my kids. So it was, you know, it was very hard. And I just, I knew something wasn't right, but I couldn't really get any help for that. Nobody knew what to do and nobody took me really seriously. And I ended up my endocrinologist in LA wanted me to go have my growth hormone test done again. I had already had one and I, my insurance only covered Cleveland clinic. So the doctor at Cleveland clinic had denied me thyroid medicine. And so when I tried to make an appointment, they said I had to see her and I said, I didn't want to see her. And so they changed me to another doctor after I explained why that I had ended up in the hospital because of her. She went and changed my medical records, including my cardiologist records and my records from her which is the same thing, you know, the OB who delivered my son had done. And something in me just snapped. Like I was just done. Now I had also tried to kill myself before because I was so tired of being sick all the time. And so it was, it was really hard. And what happened after I, I canceled my appointment, I didn't go in because I was so upset because I knew I was just going to get gaslit some more. And I, I was at the point where I couldn't even go to a doctor without shaking because I'd be so upset. And I started having a pain, which I thought was in my ovary. So I went to the hospital and they told me I had diverticulitis and they wanted to do surgery. And I said, I'm going to get a second opinion. So I left, I got a second opinion and they called me and said, get to the hospital now or you're going to die. So I went in, they wanted to take out part of my colon and I said, no, I don't want to do that. But I took the antibiotics that they pressured me into and spent the weekend in the hospital. I came home from the hospital and I was just done and I prostrated. And I begged God to let me die or show me how to heal and to make it so clear I would have no doubt in my mind. I was not hoping for recovery. I was hoping for death. I wanted to die. I was just really, really tired of fighting, of trying to advocate for myself, of being gaslit, of friends and families thinking, you know, I was a hypochondriac. 
But the weird thing is, the next day, I kid you not, the next day the answers started coming. It's just like, like God put my feet, like started moving my feet and everywhere I walked, the answers would come. And mm -hmm. I found out that I had something called Atlas subluxation complex. So the first disc in my neck had gotten dislocated when I hit my head. Mm. And I found a upper cervical chiropractor 15 minutes from my house. And he um, does these like really gentle adjustments where he presses the disc back in place. So I started seeing him. I started physical therapy. And I found that I had a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I had no idea I had that. So that I had from birth. Now, there can you can have that and have really not any problems. And then if you get sick or you, sometimes when you give birth, there's all kinds of different things that kind of activate it. So the Sheehan syndrome and the EDS are both making each other worse. Mm -hmm. And the best way to fix it is actually exercise, but you have to have the proper kind of exercise because what happens is I partially dislocate all the time. It's not as bad now because I've been doing physical therapy for a couple of years, but like my shoulder, my arm will come out of the socket, my leg will come out of the socket, my rib comes out, the my the disc in my neck comes out and that's why i was having seizures like they had wanted to put me on anti-seizure meds and i'm like you can't prove that that's because they did all these tests and brain scans and i said you can't prove it i'm not getting on the meds it was just done mm -hmm. so as i was getting all these answers and doing all these things i also did a three and a half month juice fast okay. and i don't know everything just started like coming together and the thing was it was so clear to me that god had saved me so that I could help save other women. Like I had no no doubt in my mind. It was just, you know, after 13 years of begging and begging and begging, but the thing was, I wasn't really begging God for help at that point. You know, I had been begging to get on meds, to get help from doctors. I was looking for answers in the wrong places. But when I- So when I, hmm? did you, were you a person of God or faith, a religious person prior Not religious, to, to, to that was, point? I was spiritual in a way, at least I thought I was. <laughs> um, you know, I had been to through a couple 12 step programs. Mm -hmm. And so when I had, you know, prostrated that time, I had gotten to that point, like in the first step where you admit you're powerless. And I, that's when I was like, God, I just, I can't do this on my own anymore. I'm so tired of fighting by myself. And then I have a relationship with God now that I did not know was possible. I don't, I don't take meds anymore. I'm, pretty much healed, like, except for, you know, I'm still working on the connective tissue disorder to get my body stronger to heal from the damage that was done, mm -hmm. but I'm not sick. I have no fear of health anymore. There was like a complete shift. And I've also learned that, you know, I was using the word against myself a lot, like speaking about how sick I was, speaking about how miserable I was. And I learned to stop doing that because I learned that, you know, what we say, what we think we're going to get more of. Yep. And you know, that sounds kind of harsh and I don't want to minimize what anybody's going through. But when you've come out on the other side and you've been through that, that one side, it makes sense. You just understand. And the signs were just so clear. Just a quick, it, just a quick interjection on that point. Um, like I said, I've had the condition. I, I, I try to be careful <laughs> about how I say it. I've had a condition of diabetes for 20 odd years. And um, many doctors have wondered, why am I still walking around? Why am I still alive? And I credit that to the fact that, like you just said, I don't focus on illness, you know? And some, I don't know if you have had this experience where some people um, think that you're a cold person you know, because you don't entertain that kind of conversation. You, you, you might say, I hear you. Um, I'm sorry to hear that and so forth. And that's it. I, I don't go any further in that kind of conversation. Is that yeah. your experience? Um, nobody's actually really called me cold. I try to redirect the conversation. Okay. But, um, but I understand what you're talking about because I, I don't want somebody to do that because I've learned, you know, that we're talking against ourselves. Like, um, you know, my mom used to tell me, even though she was, my parents were hippies, she always told me in the beginning, there was the word and the word was God, the word was with God. I don't remember the exact statement, but mm -hmm. I learned that, that like, basically our word is creation, our thoughts, you know, whatever we think it becomes reality. And 
so I learned to do that with my health. And then I started learning to apply that to every other area of my life after I got better, because it's really like a magic wand or a superpower. Once you realize that we have this power and it's what God brought us here for. He didn't bring us here to beg and to pray for what we don't want. We have to say what we want. You know, I'm so glad that I'm having this conversation with you tonight. I'm, I, 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 I am nothing but an honest person. I, I, I like to think of myself. And um, at about, I think I messaged you a couple hours ago and, and asked you, um, are we still on? You know, because I've had occasion where somebody for a Saturday evening conversation, they, they cancel at the last minute. And there was a part of me that was thinking, oh, maybe she won't come on, you know, but I didn't dwell in it. And um, I'm glad that we're having this conversation because just a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, we had an, I had another conversation with um, Elaine Starlin and she, she is the abundance ambassador, at least that's how she titles herself. And we're going into a workshop with her in um, our group. We have a private group here on Facebook. Uh, it's called Safe Space with the Daughters of Sheba Foundation. And we are going into a session with her. And this is exactly what she's, she, she talks about and she teaches and she, she, she professes that what you think about, you bring about. You know, and it's not just what you think about for a second, it's what you focus on. So I'm so glad that you are saying it and you're saying it from another perspective, you know, of illness, of, of health. But I also very firmly believe that a lot of my sickness was due to trauma that was stored in my body. Mm -hmm. So there's also like another connection that's taking it to another level that, you know, not everybody's open to. But I had a lot of sexual trauma in my life. When I was younger, I was molested as a toddler. And when I was 20, somebody raped and tried to kill me and I got away. And so it's interesting that, you know, I had all these problems in my uterus and that my pelvis dislocates all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I learned there's a real connection. And so I've been doing a lot of, for the last two years while I was getting stronger, like actually the last year, I've been really focusing on my emotional health and healing my stories, my old wounds, because they defined me, all my protective behaviors, you know, the addictions, all the things I went through, um, being afraid to speak out. What addictions, what, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, I was, I did cocaine okay. and I uh, was bulimic. Okay. So Can I had you explain eating. what's bulimic for people who don't understand? That's somebody who eats and, and then throws up the food. And you think it's about food, but it's not. It's about pushing down your feelings and about comfort and then about purging out those feelings that you are not able to get out, whether it's because you can't speak for yourself or people don't listen. It's like a way of getting the feelings out. So that came about, um, you think, uh, you know, are you in therapy or were you in therapy? I did therapy. Therapy didn't really help. Coaching helps. Coaching. Okay. So you, you, you did coaching, therapy and then coaching. Um, I'm working with a coach now. You're working with a coach now. Okay. So do you think that through that work, do you think that um, what happened to you as a, a, a child and then as a young adult, um, you said it affected your physical health? Yes. Okay. I'm positive. Okay. Um, I started disassociating at a young age, which, you know, is very normal when you go through something like that, but I didn't know that. And I always felt like I didn't belong in my body, which makes sense when, you know, you talk to other people who disassociate and you feel like you don't belong here. I've always felt like I don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> um, now more so than before, but that's because I got into all the old ways and, you know, I eat different than almost everybody I know. I do other things that have really helped my health, like grounding, which is walking barefoot because you get like these electrons from walking on the bare grass and it helps heal. So a lot of people, like especially older people that can't get out and walk barefoot a lot, they have pets, right? And the pets go out barefoot and they pick up those electrons and they bring them back to their sad. owner. And then I sun gaze, which is staring at the sun only in the first hour after sunrise and the hour before sunset. I had really low vitamin D levels for 13 years. I tried everything, natural, synthetic, you name it and nothing would get my D up. As soon as I started doing sun gazing, my vitamin D levels shot up. Um, fasting, prayer, meditation, breath work, these are all part of my daily life. 
and I believe they will keep me healthy. How how does your you're still married? Is that correct? Yes. How does your um, husband take all of this? He was not very supportive of the raw vegan lifestyle for a long time, but when he saw that it helped me to get my health back, he switched for a while. And he so my kids were really happy eating raw vegan, but then they are 12 and almost 16 now. So like a year and a half ago, they're like, we want cooked food. <laughs> no, I get it. Okay. It's hard and it's been a lot of work for me to let go in that area, but I did let go. So as long as they eat all their fruit and their raw vegetables, they can have their cooked dinner and then they can have some cooked snacks or whatever, but they're not allowed to touch artificial color. And my husband has become really supportive in that area, actually. I mean, he he used to make me very angry because he'd give the kids cooked food and then they wouldn't want to eat their raw food. You know, but after a while he stopped because he was so happy, you know, when when I came up from the hospital, like my family came to say goodbye. We all knew I was dying. Mm. So he was so happy to see me have a turnaround. Now, the difference is, you know, I had been raw vegan for years and it helped me stay alive. And so I got on the meds, which made me worse. So when I did that three and a half month juice fast after that, I became more fruitarian. So I used to eat more veggies and then I switched to more fruit than vegetable. So. Mm. For me, I'll have like cold pressed or fresh pressed juice for breakfast. And I'm talking like 32 ounces. I eat a lot higher calorie. When you're eating raw food, you need more calories than when you're eating fruit. And then for lunch, I'll have like fresh fruit or a smoothie. And then a few hours later, I'll have some more fruit. And then for dinner, I'll have like a salad with raw soup or I will make um, dehydrated wraps. And then I'll fill it with vegetables, cauliflower, rice, salsa, whatever I'm in the mood for. Okay. So like I actually, if you see the foods I eat, they don't look that different other than I don't eat a lot of processed stuff. Processed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as we, you know, get into approaching our, our mark here, um, can you summarize for me or for the audience, those watching now and, and those who will watch later, particularly for women, you know, because as I said earlier, there was a young lady for, I, I'm sure if I click somewhere else, I'll find it because we posted about it, um, who was misdiagnosed. It's just that she was popular. So that's why it made the news, uh, well, the social media news. So can you tell people watching you, women in particular, and wherever they live, um, what are some of the things that they should be doing when they know that something is going on and the doctors is, as the clip that we show, is gaslighting them, saying that, ah, it's just this, ah, it's just that. You know, just just, just to praise my doctor right now, I have a, a Nigerian doctor and um, I came across him by chance, actually my daughter, and usually I don't pay attention to my doctors. I listen to this man and um, he's... He, he's not forceful, but he just tells me as it is, and he doesn't hold back. So not everybody like you and I are now fortunate to have, you know, physicians like that. What, based on your experience, what would be your top three recommendation to women when, and I'm saying, I'm, yes, I'm focusing on women because we are a woman-focused organization, but, you know, we do have men with us. To well, women... Yeah. The first one would be Facebook support groups because that's where I learned. I learned how to read my medical labs. I learned what to say to doctors, how to speak to doctors so I don't hurt their little egos. <laughs> um, because they're especially endocrinologists are very egotistical. Research, learn. The Facebook groups are like the best for it. I found a support group when I joined, there were about 300 women. There's 900 of us now with my condition. And the second would be to really focus on what you want out of it. Don't think about all the symptoms and all the fear. I mean, it's good to note, to note it, like, you know, write it down so you have it in a file for your doctor, but don't talk about it to everybody. In your Facebook support groups, yes, but not, not your family and friends a lot. Like, don't keep speaking about all your symptoms because you're just feeding them, even though you're not in it. I feel bad saying that because... I know when I was sick, Don't all I wanted bad. to do was talk about it because I wanted to feel validated. Don't feel but, bad. But, you know, that validation can also turn against you when you're talking about it all the time. So think about what you want. And my third is 
nature, the old ways. I call them the old ways. My kids mm -hmm. call them my, what do they call them? I forgot. My rituals. <laughs> <laughs> but get outside. Even if all you can do is lay on the ground, lay on the ground outside. There's something about nature that helps heal you. Go outside and walk. When I first started walking, I could only walk five minutes a day. When I started physical therapy, I couldn't even stand straight. So I had to exercise laying down. Get your body stronger because when you're sick, you don't do it intentionally, but we start losing muscle and that creates all kinds of other health issues. Like, like uh, the passing out with my blood pooling to my feet. But, you know, having a support network is important because the women in those groups, you know, they understand what you're going through and you can vent a little bit to them, but they're not just going to like give you sympathy or, you know, not acknowledge you. They're going to be like, okay, here's what you need to know. Here's what you're going to do. This is how you're going to get better. And that, like, I don't, I know I wouldn't be alive without those groups. Wow. Wow. And, and um, on the spiritual side, um, what would you say to a woman now who is questioning God or source or the creator or life, you know, because she's going through so much, you know, and, um, and I'm not talking about the women who are, um, and please excuse me, ladies, for saying this, but the biblical fanatics. Um, I'm talking about a woman who who really is looking for an answer, a way out of whatever it is she's experiencing. I've learned to do something we call scripting. So the short version is you want to make a list of the 10 things you want, like if your life is ideal. So when my life is ideal, I'm in perfect health. When my life is ideal, I make this much money. When my life is ideal, I have this relationship, whatever it is. And then you write it into a little script. like, And you put all the things you, you can think of, how you dress, how you feel, what you do during your day. And then you record it and you listen to it every morning when you get up and every night right before you go to bed. I'm telling you, even if you don't believe in it, do it. And you're going to start watching magic happen in your life. Like magic. Wow. It's It's one of the most intense things I've ever learned. And I only learned to do this. Back, I started doing it in September, I think, or August. Of last year, August. Yeah. And manifested my dream home within three weeks. Um, I have, you know, I had some issues with my husband not wanting to acknowledge that he had ADHD or do anything about it. And he's like taking care of it now. He's working with a coach. Um, my my mom is getting help with her issues because she like. She was also molested by her father. My father who molested me was molested by his father. There's a lot of sexual abuse you know, in my past. And, you know, my mom has always been kind of had a really hard time. Like I've, you know, used to speak up for myself and then I stopped and then I started again. But she has a hard time and she's always wondering what's wrong with her. I'm like, you have a lot of unresolved trauma that you need to deal with. And so she's finally getting help. So I didn't just start healing myself. I've pulled in my whole circle. All my family are, are like doing work now because they've seen such a turnaround in me. And um, if you look on my Facebook profile, you'll see how sick I was. Um, I didn't mention it, but I also lost my teeth because of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I was very shy about it I, because I the connective tissue disorder, since I didn't know I had it, the prednisone that I was on deteriorated my teeth because it interferes with collagen production. And they crumbled and I ended up getting them removed. And... I promised God that when I got dental implants, I would start speaking out. So I got them done in May. And once I was able to speak without drooling, <laughs> I started speaking out. And it's my life mission is just to speak out and help other women know you are not alone and that you can come from the worst situation and end up with everything you want in life, which I, I had thought wasn't possible. I really didn't believe that I could have the life of my dreams. And yet I'm watching it unfold around me every day. Anya, as we wrap up here, I am going to be in touch with you because um, as we say it within our foundation, as the, the, the members, the, the directors of the foundation, our mission is to help one woman at a time, one man even at a time. I, I, I noticed Gabriel is here with us and he, he's saying something. Let me put on my glasses. I like your point about the connection with nature because it really heals and eating natural foods help a lot. Yes. 
And um, thank you for, for saying that, Gabriel. And um, we, I would love to have you talk to my group um, on a more direct basis, just us, um, so that because sometimes they need to hear it from somebody else, except for, it's not, not just me, you know, who I say this has happened to me and so forth. They need to hear it from somebody else. And we are going to be having a session in April, I think it's April 16, with Elaine Starling, as I said. She, she teaches abundance, you know, how to manifest. You know, you're talking about kind of the same thing, but I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in your technique of scripting. And I would love for you to share with my group and maybe even take them through the paces, not more than longer than we've been here tonight, of scripting and share your story. I want to thank you so much for sitting on the bench with me tonight, mm -hmm. having this chat. You know, um, I when when we first connected and you told me the story, well, you didn't tell me, you wrote to me and, and with the story. I didn't know that this, it was this deep. <laughs> Neither did I. I. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that it was this deep. I didn't know. I I honestly didn't know about the spiritual connection. But you know what? It's called synchronicity because yes. th this is a path that we are on as a foundation. You know, there are lots of um, people on social media and they're here with the drama and so forth. We don't do that at this foundation. We do what you are doing. We 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 like what you are doing. You know. Um, lending your voice, sharing your experience, and helping one woman at a time to make a difference in her life. Any last word, tidbit that you would like to share with us this evening before we go? If you can, even if it's not in person, and mine is not really in person, find your circle. Find some women that have the same beliefs as you. Because you know there are days when it's hard, when my family is driving me insane, or my pelvis dislocates and I'm feeling miserable, or I wanna go eat a bunch of processed food, and I message one of my friends, even if they can't respond right away, I know that I've sent something to them and they're gonna see it and they're gonna respond. And it, it helps a lot. It's just really helped me to feel better. And, you know, cause I felt so isolated and alone for so many years and I didn't tell people how sick I was. I just withdrew from everybody. So find your tribe basically yeah. is what you're saying. Find your tribe. Um, I, I, I have my little own tribe too, outside of the foundation. So I know exactly what you mean. Thank you so much, Anya, for sitting with me um, this evening and having this conversation. Like I said, I am going to be in touch and mm -hmm. set up a time for you to, to talk with um, the members of, of, of the Daughters of Sheba Foundation Safe Space. Um, hopefully, Gabriel can be there as well because um, just before we go, can you once again just briefly for those women among us right now who might be pregnant, watching us right now or watching us later, who might be pregnant and might be at risk for, although you said it's a small percentage, but just say again, what is this Sheehan's syndrome and what are some of the warning signs they should be looking for as we wrap up? So actually the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the connective tissue disorder I have, so if you're double jointed, you're at higher risk for hemorrhaging. Okay, so that's something that if you are double jointed, point it out to your doctor. If you think you're gonna have complications or you're at a high risk pregnancy, make sure they have blood waiting for you, transfusion available in case you need it. Now, and really learn to advocate for yourself. And if your doctor doesn't like it, find a new one. Like, you don't have to settle. You have to remember you're paying them. They work for you. It's that simple. You know, we could have, maybe I should have you again on with a, with a panel of women to talk about the healthcare system in the United States, you know. <laughs> I know Canada is not much better, but. <laughs> no, well, Canada, at least we don't go bankrupt to see yeah, a doctor. We don't true. go bankrupt to see a doctor or a specialist. It might take us a while. <laughs> to the, see mental, all... the mental health, you know, situation there, because I have some friends there, you know, is really not very helpful they make you wait forever yeah but like i said I, I guess i guess my my scripting is working for me because <laughs> that has not been my experience <laughs> that is true too you know if you think that you're not going to get the help you won't so yeah yeah believe believe that you're gonna um get the help and you know my coach what i love that she says is even if you can't believe it borrow my belief yep 
fake or, it till you make it. I was about to say that. That's exactly <laughs> what I was about to say. Some people knock it and sometimes it doesn't really work. But yeah, fake it till you make it, you know. And like I said, my experience in the Canadian with the Canadian healthcare system, to 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 knock wood, except for one situation with my daughter. Um, she was misdiagnosed because they didn't understand 20 years ago what sickle cell looks like because my daughter is a sickler. They didn't know what that looked like, but um, it has been positive, my experience with the Canadian healthcare system. Thank you so much for being here this evening, yeah. Anya, and um, I will be in touch, and um, I'm sure others will be in touch with you too to hear more. Awesome. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you to those who will be watching afterwards. You know, we normally package bits of the information and reshare. So um, thank you for watching whenever you're watching. Have a good evening and uh, we will see you next week, Tuesday, when we um, have our these three plus things conversation. Thanks again, Anya. You're welcome. Bye.